Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Afia Atamensa, and I serve as the Executive Director of Community Voices Heard. We are proud members of the People's Coalition for Manhattan DA Accountability. The People's Coalition is comprised of Vocal New York, Citizen Action, Releasing Aging People in Prison, Prison Reform Organizing Project, Getting Out and Staying Out, the New York Working Families Party, my former union, the mighty ALAA UAW Local 2325, Black Attorneys of the Legal Aid Society, the Urban Justice Center, Color of Change, Catal Center, Brooklyn Community Bail Fund, the Center for Community Alternatives, the Policing Social Justice Project of Brooklyn College, and of course, our media partner, WBAI. We have come together this evening uh, to host this forum to ensure that there is a space where people most impacted by the outcomes of this election can hear firsthand from the individuals vying for this position. Deep organizing by Black and Latinx people in commu communities across the country have forced a different conversation in this nation in regards to how the war on drugs, zero tolerance police policies, and law and order prosecution have targeted Black communities indigenous communities and communities of color. The impact on having individuals removed from their families and, com and communities for years and at times decades cannot be properly articulated in the little limited time that I have this evening. What I can say is that it is way past time for a reckoning on the role that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has played in orchestrating and continuing a system that disproportionately targets, prosecutes, and imprisoned Black and Latinx communities as common practice, and where the D district attorney lifts up this track record of doing so as their entree to higher office. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we fully intend to have a conversation to learn how these candidates, if elected, will wield the power of this office, for whom and to what end. Now, this forum was originally scheduled for January 6th. And due to the actions of white supremacists who stormed the Capitol, we saw it prudent to reschedule for a later date. And so here we are tonight, and I'm so glad that you're with us. But I would be remiss if I did not mention that it was telling that some of the participants of and organizers of those events on January 6th were members of law enforcement. Listen, the next district attorney will need to deal with systemic issues within the police department. Some of you out there may be old enough to remember of the police riot against Dinkins, and for those of us with eyes, we saw how the NYPD has engaged over the last few months in response to peaceful protests right here in our city. You know, we wanna know if these candidates think there is a systemic problem of racism in law enforcement, and if so, how that impacts what will be brought to their desk as a prosecutor. Folks, tonight we seek to move beyond academic debates and get down to the get down of how these candidates would actually move if elected district attorney. And to help guide us through this important conversation, we have two amazing moderators. Sally Isra. Sally is the Director of Partnerships and Technology at the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund. He is a prison industrial complex abolitionist who served as an advisor to the board, to the directors of Bard Prison Initiative. He is a formerly incarcerated software engineer who founded Reentry Connect LLC to reimagine ways of connecting formerly incarcerated people to much needed resources. And our co-moderator is my dear sister in the struggle, Christina Swarms. Christina is the executive director of the Innocence Project. She previously served as the president and attorney in charge of the Office of the Appellate Defender. And prior to that, uh, she served as the litigation director for the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. I can't think of two better people to lead us through tonight's conversation. And with that, I turn it over to the able hands of our esteemed moderators. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, We're gonna keep a really strict schedule uh, in order to make it through all of the questions tonight. So every set of questions will come with a time limit and that's usually going to be 30 seconds or one minute. We may offer follow-ups to specific questions. If candidates call each other out by name, we will provide 20 or 30 second rebuttal time opportunities. 
For the audience, if you have questions, we encourage you to drop them into the chat and we will do our best to get to them at the end of the program. Candidates, we have live Spanish translation. So please keep that in mind as you're giving your answers, speak slowly and clearly. With that said, we're gonna ask each candidate to give us a brief opening statement. In 30 seconds, please tell us who you are and why you're the best candidate for this position. Ms. Florence, 30 seconds. Thanks so much. I'm Diana Florence. I'm running for DA to fight for the people that have been harmed and overlooked by the criminal justice system. It's what I've done my entire career from within the system. As leader of the construction fraud task force, I targeted crimes of power, not crimes of poverty. I spent my career fighting against corporations that steal wages and kill their workers, those that abuse their domestic partners, and big real estate who rip off tenants. I have the support from over a dozen labor unions hundreds of thousands of workers who know that no one in this race has my record of standing up to power. Thanks so much for having me this evening. Ms. Abushi, 30 seconds. Thank you. At 14 years old, my parents stood trial. My mother was charged to force my father to take a plea, and my nine siblings and I were simply leverage for the system. I saw firsthand the damage and destruction the prosecution system causes to our communities. It's why I became a civil rights attorney. And for over a decade, I have fought against these very abuses. I'm running for Manhattan District Attorney to ensure we end mass incarceration. No longer will communities of color be the face of crime in the city and we will invest in our communities. Thank you. Mr. Bragg, 30 seconds. Growing up in Harlem, I was stopped countless times by the NYPD, three times at gunpoint. These early experiences are why, for the past 20 plus years, I fought for civil rights, equity, and fairness in our court system, prosecuting law enforcement, standing up to landlords who harass tenants, and holding accountable employers who committed wage theft. These are the personal and professional experiences we need to fundamentally reform the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Thank you. Ms. Farhadi and Weinstein, 30 seconds. Sorry, I was on mute. 40 years ago, my immigrant family and I arrived at JFK airport with just a few suitcases. We struggled for a decade in a legal system that often felt inexplicable to become American citizens, to live in fairness and safety. And I never take those things for granted. I know that equal opportunity depends on them. I have fought for fairness and safety from the Supreme Court to the US Department of Justice to federal prosecution, to enacting historic criminal justice reform in the Brooklyn DA's office. And I'll keep going as Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Ms. Lang, 30 seconds. I was a city kid. I'm a parent, a teacher in prisons, a former ADA who's worked with survivors of heinous violence and a national criminal justice reformer. Community-based solutions and restorative justice are vital to addressing trauma and preserving dignity to make our city safe and healthy. That means treating kids like kids, treating substance use and mental health conditions as health problems, ending mass incarceration. I'm an advocate for restoring the right to vote to incarcerated people while they're incarcerated so that all voices are heard. The DA must take a 360 degree view of everyone the system touches. And that's why I'm running for DA. Mr. Court, 30 seconds. Good evening. My name is Dan Court. I'm a state legislator and experienced 21 year litigator, three years of criminal defense work representing people who could not afford an attorney. And I'm running for Manhattan District Attorney not to do the small things, not to be another prosecutor, but to break down and rebuild an office that is not functioning and not functioning how it should be, especially in communities of color. And I'll do that in three very specific ways revamping the sex crimes unit within the office, ending surveillance based technology. And the thing I'm most synonymous with my 10 years in Albany, decarceration and ending the punishment of poverty that provides no public safety benefit to Manhattanites. Thank you. Ms. Orleans, 30 seconds. I'm Eliza Orleans. I'm the only public defender in this race. Today was a big day for our campaign. We put out a robust policy on the decriminalization of sex work and we're honored to receive the least harmful rating from 5BD. 
Most candidates here were prosecutors, all of whom have spent their careers perpetuating an unjust and inhumane system. As progressives, we can't now trust them to fix it. We must vote true to our values, and I'm the only one with a clear understanding, informed by experience handling thousands of cases in criminal court, of the harmful policies and practices that I will undo as your next Manhattan District Attorney. And Ms. Crotty, 30 seconds. Thanks. I'm Liz Crotty. I've been a defense attorney for the past 13 years, and for six, I was a Manhattan DA. I have experience on both sides of the courtroom. I've represented clients and people who have mental health issues, who have gone through mental health treatment court. I have had clients who've had multiple arrests, who finally got sober, and people who have ultimately had to go to jail. And what I've learned in that is rooted in every person charged with a crime is that they need to be held accountable. I did not fill out the questionnaire for tonight's forum. That's because I think the facts and context in every case matter because there are people behind those facts and those contexts. I was in court this week, virtually albeit, arguing for no order of protection on a cross complaint. I believe in these things, but I do not believe that that should be the situation in every case. That is not the way to practice criminal justice law. And if after 21 years I have learned anything, it is that there are no absolutes. Thanks and I look forward to tonight. Thank you all for those very brief but meaningful introductions. Our first question is for two of the candidates, Ms. Abushi and Ms. Orleans. The Manhattan DA overwhelmingly prosecutes pure and working class communities of color, which destabilizes our communities and feeds mass incarceration. The district attorney should be focused on reducing community destabilization by strengthening the size, scope, and resources of the office. As the only candidates who have committed to cutting the Manhattan District Attorney's $169 million budget by 50%, please explain why this is necessary and how it will impact the way the District Attorney's office operates. Ms. Abushi, you have one minute to answer. The only way we're going to shrink the footprint of this office is by declining to prosecute as many cases as possible, uh, including those stemming from social inequities like substance use disorder, poverty, homelessness, mental illness, uh, and other ways of life like sex work. Um, a lot of the budget for the Manhattan DA's office was increased to actually um, uh, handle criminal justice reforms and majority of it went to um, data collection, IT enhancements, uh, and more staff to prosecute. And so under the facade of criminal justice reform, the budget expanded. And so what we need to do and what I will do is focus on the Early Case Assessment Bureau, which I intend to actually get rid of and replace with an arrest review unit that is focused on declining to prosecute cases as opposed to looking at allegations from law enforcement and trying to figure out what charges would stick. Ms. Orleans, your turn for one minute. So first and foremost, we must achieve a dramatic reduction in the number of cases that flow through criminal court on a daily basis by declining to prosecute the majority of misdemeanors, almost all misdemeanors. And I've been working really hard with my team and my criminologist to figure out exactly which cases we will decline to prosecute as district attorney, because you know I don't wanna put stuff up on my website and then have to walk it back later. I wanna make sure that I'm being extremely thoughtful about this. And so far we've only come up with about a handful of misdemeanors that should continue to be prosecuted and we should never seek incarceration on those cases. So by doing that, we will be able to reduce the scope of that office, reduce the budget by 50%. We can let go of the majority of the people who handle misdemeanor cases. There's no reason to continue prosecuting these things. I've seen it as a public defender in the thousands of people I've represented, seen the way in which they've been harmed by this unjust system that, that criminalizes the color of their skin, their income level, um, you know, or their, their substance use disorder or mental health issue. And so we must decrease that. And I'm proud to be one of the two people who has signed on in full. This next question is for Mr. Court, Ms. Bragg, Mr. Bragg and Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. All other candidates should now turn off their videos and mute themselves. All of the candidates have indicated that in some way they are, they are not going to prosecute um, sort of police initiated incidents like buying busts, like selling methadone to undercovers and like uh, Operation Lucky Bag. Mr. Court, 
uh, Mr. Mr. Bragg and Mr. Ms. Farhadi and Weinstein have offered different approaches with Mr. Court offering the most uh, a significant commitment to decline to prosecute. Uh, Ms. Farhadi and Weinstein, uh, he went closest to uh, the current administration and uh, Mr. Bragg standing somewhere in the middle. I would love to have each of you explain your position on reform and comment specifically on the harm you think that these practices have had on black and brown communities in New York City. We're gonna begin with Mr. Court. You have one minute to answer. Well, thank you for the question. It's an important question. And I did set forth the specific list of uh, charges I would decline to prosecute, but it even goes beyond that. You're speaking about uh, even specific instances, uh, driving with a suspended license. One example, something I fought very hard to achieve legislation in Albany as a co-sponsor. But uh, 80 per, uh, 76, uh, 80 percent of uh, 76 percent of car owners in New York City are people of color. But 80 percent of those who find themselves prosecuted, uh, I, I got the statistic wrong, 76 percent of those uh, who are prosecuted are people of color, even though 80 percent of car owners are white. There's nothing wrong with the words of, stat, of the statute, but something is going on out there in the community, in communities of color, where these arrests are coming disproportionately against people of color. And that's the type of criminal charges I'm gonna to decline to prosecute. If the city of New York in its infinite wisdom wants to write a summons to someone to garnish their wages for driving with a suspended license, they can do that. But I won't elevate this to the criminal court because it clearly has a disproportionate racial effect. It's those type of crimes um, that I will not only decline to prosecute, but I, I, I will look to, to, to bring down charges. Um, declining, uh, and, okay. and that's responsive to time. Thank you. Mr. Bragg, you have one minute. So when I was growing up in Harlem, my mom used to always tell me, if someone asked me where the drug location was on our block, which I knew where it was, never to answer. I didn't understand then, but the reason why is because of these NYPD tactics of gotcha. Uh, you mentioned lucky, lucky bag, Miss Miss Warren. These these things where they're essentially entrapping folks. Uh, I'm going to not do any of those cases. I'm going to instruct the next police commissioner. Uh, don't bring them to my office because I'm not going to do them. They're fundamentally unfair. Uh, but I will also go further than that. Uh, the, the the statistic. I don't know if this is what Mr. Court was looking for, but 82 percent of all cases prosecuted in New York City are either misdemeanors or non-criminal offenses. Under my watch, we're going to do almost none of those. We're going to drastically reduce that. So not just the coercive policing tactics, but also this misdemeanor docket that really is about control. We're going to stop that. And the stat there is 80 percent of those cases are brought against people of color. So we're going to end the practice. We're going to focus on true public safety, which is what I've done throughout my career. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Farhadian Weinstein, you've got one minute. Thank you, uh, Farhadian Weinstein. Thanks. Uh, look, uh, in cases that have had widespread racial disparities in their enforcement, like the ones that were in this question, or that sound in mental health that really reflect drug addiction, we have to be really careful. And I think the DA's office has to be transparent in what it prosecutes. I think we have to have a list of what we would decline. I've, and I have committed to not prosecuting Operation Lucky Bag, which was in the question. Cases where we would prosecute differently. So arrest, but then divert to services that people need and cases that need close supervisory review uh, because of the ways in which they've been abused. But you know, I'll say about buy and busts, this is a public health crisis. We're not trying to go after people who have chemical dependencies, but I can tell you from having been a prosecutor of drug conspiracies that really created a lot of violence uh, when I was working for Loretta Lynch, sometimes you have to smart start with the small cases in order to be able to build the big cases. Thank you. So our next question is for Ms. Lang, Ms. Florence, and Ms. Crotty. So I'm asking all of the candidates to turn off their video and mute themselves now. We postponed this forum from January 6th because of the insurrection in Washington, D.C. It seemed relevant to discuss this during the forum tonight as the issue of white supremacy and law enforcement obviously came to the front of this conversation. This isn't a bad apple question. We are talking about systemic issues. Do you think there's a systemic problem of racism in law enforcement, specifically in New York City? If yes, 
How do you think that impacts what comes onto your desk as a prosecutor and what will you do to address it? If no, how do you account for the disproportionately high number of black and brown people who are arrested, prosecuted, and incarcerated? Ms. Lang, you're a woman in answer. Thank you. There is no doubt that the legacy of white supremacy has informed the evolution of prosecution in this country and contributed to the egregious racial disparities at every level of the criminal justice system. That's why I released a plan for addressing racial injustice in the system that includes shrinking the footprint of the system. The system is completely bloated and fixing that requires declining to prosecute cases that don't belong in the system, diverting cases that are actually mental health or substance health, substance use issues into public health systems so that people can get the supportive services that they need. It includes reducing the reliance on mandatory minimums, on three strikes laws, and on unduly lengthy sentences, even with respect to violent crime. And all of those strategies to shrink the criminal justice system are ultimately going to get us closer to getting the racial injustice out of the system, despite the fact that it is baked in from the very beginning. Ms. Florence, go ahead for your one minute answer. More than a dozen years ago, I prosecuted a major in, uh, fraud in the construction industry, which involved companies that falsified the safety of our buildings. And it started with the company trying to scapegoat a formerly incarcerated black man saying that he was the cause of the falsifications. If that isn't proof that there is systemic racism that even corporate executives thought that that would be the way to address when they were caught out for faking the concrete strength, that is, that is as clear as day. And so I acknowledge as well that we have to see that and we have to address it. And I have plans for that. For example, we are gonna go after police officers who lie and police officers who abuse and kill. And we will make sure that they are held accountable through our police accountability unit, getting the information from the communities. We will also work hand in hand with communities to address racial disparities and, and address gun trafficking and other violent crimes. Because frankly, we know that violent crimes disproportionately affect low income communities, but they're not getting the protection they need, frankly, because they are harmed and avoided. I will change that in my DA's office. Ms. Karate, your turn for one minute answer. Yeah, I, I didn't, I missed the first half of the question because my camera oh. froze. I'm sorry. The first set of questions was, uh, one, this isn't a bad Apple question. We are talking about systemic raci racism issues. Do you think there is a systemic problem of racism in law enforcement, specifically in New York City? If yes, how do you think that impacts what comes onto your desk as a prosecutor and what will you do to address it? If no, how do you account for the disproportionately high number of black and brown people who are arrested, prosecuted and incarcerated? Well, yeah, I mean, we can all see saw what happened on January 6th and the picture of the National Guard and the Black Lives Matter on the Capitol versus um, what we saw on the Capitol on January 6th. A person from my campaign who is a person of color was sitting here watching um, the events of January 6th uh, that day. And he was he was remarking, why aren't they shot? If that were me, they would be shot. So to sit here and say that there aren't racial disparities, you, you can't. But I do think you have to look at it in terms of the each and every case is different and look at each and every case. I think the bigger issue is really looking to implicit bias and how implicit bias really um, kind of affects every decision that we make as prosecutors in what to charge, how to charge, um, and also to uh, bail and please, and also to in victims. Uh, victims are just as much as a, a you know, as bad, treated badly by his implicit bias. So I think you have to really look to implicit bias and look to um, ways that you can attack impl implicit bias from within the prosecution office that really looks at the way we prosecute and really creates a mechanism so that we look at the facts of each and every case and not the ethnicity of who these people, who the people are committing the, case, the crime and Fine. who the people are who are the victims of the crime. Thanks. Thank you. This next question is for Ms. Orleans, Ms. Abushi, and Mr. Court. Each of you have promised significant reforms to the Manhattan DA's office, which if implemented, will significantly challenge the current norms of the office. 
Across the country, we have seen significant backlash uh, after the election of reform-minded elected district attorneys. For example, assistant district attorneys in Los Angeles County have sued uh, district attorney George Gascon, um, and in Cook County, the police unions have gone after Kim Fox. This obviously creates a significantly challenging situation for a new executive uh, who campaigns on a platform of meaningful change. Do you believe that there's gonna be backlash in the office to the policies that you're proposing that you implement? And if so, how do you plan to manage that? And please, in your answers, be specific. Ms. Orleans, you have one minute. Thanks for that question. So as the only candidate who spent my entire career going toe to toe with this district attorney's office in the courtroom, I have seen the devastating effects of its culture of prosecutorial misconduct and mismanagement on a daily basis firsthand. As the only public defender in the race, I will come to the office with a clear understanding of not only what the stakes are for people's lives, but how to enact real reforms. I mean, I have gone up against this office. I know the bureau chiefs. I know the assistant district attorneys. I know the deputies. I know the people there. And I know who will be in line with my vision for what this office will look like when it is decarceral and trying to actively not do harm and destroy families and, and incarcerate people. Um, and, and I know who, who might be able to, to kind of fall in line with my vision. Um, and that's due to my experience. And so I think that, you know, the ethical obligations of a prosecutor have, have really not been being upheld. And I think the Manhattan District Attorney's Office is in desperate need of real reform. But I, I plan to staff it with people like public defenders and people who've left that office because they didn't want to perpetuate the system. Ms. Abushi, one minute. I'm the only candidate here that has the experience going up against agencies like the NYPD and forcing them to change their ideology and culture. Um, all of the DAs that you have um, mentioned are being sued mainly by law enforcement agencies. Um, and I'm the only candidate here to ensure that officers are terminated, disciplined, or criminally charged for their conduct. And so it will be a priority for me to establish this office independent from law enforcement, clean house when I get in there, and usher in my partners in co-governance, those who I'm working with now. And I think it's imperative to ensure that we have the community as our partners as we enter this office and people with lived experience, because that is what has been missing in this conversation. And when you cut the community out and your transition team is strictly a bunch of lawyers, you end up hiring expert criminologists to tell you about the discriminatory impacts of the system who can only come up with a handful of five misdemeanors knowing full well the Manhattan DA's problem is that it overcharges felonies like it's giving out candy. And so if we're really gonna be serious about shrinking this footprint and transforming this office, we have to do it realistically with the impacted community by our side and a transition team that's going to push our vision forward. Thank you, Mr. Court, one minute. Yes, uh, three things to change the culture, recruitment, retention, and personnel. Recruitment. Um, right now, the, the district attorney's office uh, uh, recruits from across the country uh, looking for the best and brightest. Um, I think I can achieve both diversity and excellence from our New York City public school, excuse me, New York City law schools. And I think I can achieve that diversity and excellence right here and not have to go elsewhere across the country. And I'll get a different type of young lawyer. Secondly, retention. We're losing too many of our young lawyers in the Manhattan DA's office after they do their three years uh, in, within the office. What I'm gonna do is use some of the money from the forfeiture fund pot to offset loan costs so I can keep these new lawyers, these young lawyers in years four, five, six, and seven to build up the pipeline to a bureau chief or assistant bureau chief. And lastly, it's personnel. The changes have to go deep and they have to go beyond the leadership team. When Larry Krasner came into Philadelphia within the first year of his office, there was an approximately 28% turnover. If you replicate that in Manhattan, that's about 158 lawyers uh, within the office that would have to be changed. Now, I'm, not, I'm never gleeful in terminating anyone, and we're not going to terminate anyone just for the sake of numbers. But I'm talking about wholesale changes within the office that are systemic and go beyond the leadership team. Thank you. This next question is for Ms. Fahadi and Weinstein, Ms. Bragg, Mr. Bragg, Ms. Florence, Ms. Crotty. And Ms. Lang. 
For decades, we have witnessed routine police brutality and overreach that terrorizes black and brown communities. District attorneys work closely with the police, which creates a conflict of interest for police accountability. How will you address increased demands for accountability processes that are led by communities instead of law enforcement? Mr. Bragg, you may go first. You have one minute. So I've got the deepest experience, both personal and professional, in this issue. I'm still the 15-year-old kid staring at the other end of the, the, the gun on 139th Street and 7th Avenue, stopped multiple times by the NYPD. And I've dedicated my whole career to this issue, uh, suing the state police for excessive force, uh, prosecuting an FBI agent for lying, uh, and leading uh, the statewide unit at the Attorney General's office. And we did it in partnership with community stakeholders. We did it in the most transparent way in the history of our country. Uh, and I would do that again at the DA's office uh, several ways. Have a unit that is staffed, that is outside of the main DA's office, uh, that is not doing any work with the NYPD. Uh, do it in conjunction, not with just uh, lawyers, uh, but our social workers, our outreach, and in partnership with the community, like I did at the AG's office, uh, and to be transparent and report out to the public, like I did at the AG's office as well, and to continue, as I've done, to fight for a harder standard on police officers in Albany. Ms. Fahadi and Weinstein, one minute, please. Thank you. Uh, those community demands are welcome because look, we have to work through this together. Um, we are in an intolerable place. You know, all of us should feel ashamed to live in a city where some people feel safer when they see the police and some fe people feel less safe when they see the police. And it starts with working together on solutions. It starts with honesty from the DA's office. You know, I'm proud that with the Innocence Project, we put out a elaborate report about our first 25 exonerations in the Conviction Review Unit in Brooklyn and called out the police as well as prosecutors, as well as other folks who work in the criminal justice system for the ways in which they have done harm and actually stolen uh, years from people's lives. I built a standalone law enforcement accountability bureau in the Brooklyn DA's office. We investigated and prosecuted police officers for acts of violence and also for lying under oath, you know, crimes that are, are wrong in any case and have the added harm of demoralizing people and reducing trust in the criminal justice system. And I would bring all of that to Manhattan. Uh, Ms. Karate, you have one minute. Yeah, I, I think, you know, the Manhattan DA's office does have a separate unit in, in public corruption that deals with police, uh, police crimes. And I think that we need to strengthen that. And they do the, the people who work in that bureau are actually in a totally separate bureau and they do not do any and a separate building and they don't do any other crimes besides public corruption. I think you need to strengthen that. I've represented a police officer who was charged with the crime. Um, and no matter what happened at the end of that crime, that police officer was losing their job. I've also sued the NYPD um, and I've been privy to, to what that entails. I think you have to really look, you know, again, you have to look at each and every case and what are the police officers doing? What are the police officers saying? If you cannot prove your case because of that police officer, you should be dismissing that case. And I think holding people, police officers in every case accountable is the way to get a fair result. Thank you. Ms. Florence, you now have one minute. You know, I haven't had the lived experiences of people of color, but I've done the work to make sure that people of color and low income communities are championed by the criminal justice system by going after wage theft and housing fraud and health and safety violations. That approach, which was community based, involved me leaving my office and being proactive, looking for the cases, not waiting for them to come to me. That is exactly the approach I will take with police accountability. Yes, there already exists an independent unit. Um, that's true. But we need to have a unit that does something. And the way we're going to do that is get the information, partner with the CCRB and community-based organizations to get the information. We're also going to proactively look through 50A. It has now been declassified. We can find the fraud. We can find the abuses. We can find the office who are the most egregious, and we will proactively and transparently do those cases. Ms. Lang, finally, you have uh, one minute to answer. It's time for a new era of police accountability. Just an hour ago, I got off the phone with my friend and supporter, Valerie Castile, 
whose son, Philando Castile, is a name that no doubt many of you know. And I'm reminded of the fact that Philando was stopped by police in his car at least 50 times before he was ultimately killed on video during a car stop. One way to address issues of police misconduct is to limit the amount of police contact in communities. And that starts with community-based initiatives and with all the strategies I previously described to shrink the criminal justice footprint. The district attorney's office also has to be proactive in NYPD training and policy. That's why I worked alongside Ms. Castile and others who lost loved ones to police violence, who I'm proud to say have endorsed me, to develop a plan for police accountability that I'm committed to as district attorney. It includes partnering with the other agencies who investigate fatalities, calling for publication and transparency of investigations into police brutality and misconduct, reviewing body-worn camera footage, and conducting a thorough and complete investigation in every instance where there's an allegation of misconduct. Thank you. This next question is close to my work at the Innocence Project, and it is for Ms. Lang, Mr. Bragg, Ms. Florence, and Mr. Court. You will each have 45 seconds to answer. The National Registry of Exonerations reports that New York State has the third highest number of exonerations in the country, with 303 people exonerated since 1989. Conviction integrity units have emerged as a response to the national crisis on wrongful convictions. What is your assessment of the current work of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, CIU? And if you are elected DA, what kinds of cases will you commit to reviewing? Will you go beyond pure cases of innocence to include unjust convictions and sentences, for example, convictions that rest on jury discrimination, and or discredited forensic techniques like arson cases, bite mark cases, hair comparison, and shaken baby cases? Ms. Lang, you have 45 seconds. It's time for a massive expansion of the Conviction Integrity Unit in Manhattan. There is nothing worse for the integrity of the system than wrongful convictions or convictions that are based on outdated or faulty evidence. So in addition to reviewing for claims of innocence, I'm committed to a unit that will re review the kinds of cases that you just described. But beyond that, also to sealing eligible cases by working with community partners, committed to sentence review, to reduce the length of sentences that are no longer consistent with contemporary norms. I'm committed to legislative review and advocacy to address these issues so that they are not a problem in the future and to annual reporting that will publicize the, the work of this unit so that the public can hold me accountable for these promises because accountability is absolutely critical to the work of a conviction integrity unit. Thank you. Mr. Bragg, 45 seconds. Yes, uh, so I want to directly answer your question. The unit now is a conviction review unit in name only. It is not actively working. It needs to be completely redone. And we need to start first with having an office that uh, is truly independent. I have a friend who recently appeared before that unit and the person leading the, the meeting for the DA's office was someone who'd actually worked on the case. We need complete independence. We need open files so folks like the Innocence Project and Defense Council can come in. We need a unit headed by someone who's never worked in the Manhattan DA's office. That's the first thing in terms of structurally. Specifically, yes, all the kind of cases you mentioned, we're going to look at bad science, uh, unjust convictions, and we're also going to reopen uh, the cases done by the exonerated Central Park Five team. Uh, we need to look at all of that and do it like Ken Thompson did in Brooklyn, where he looked at the detective and follow all the leads. We cannot just Thank sit you. on that one case. Thank you. Ms. Florence, 45 seconds. Conviction integrity units are, are only as good as what they're willing to do. And the current DA's office uh, version is just a PR stunt and we have to call it out for what it is. And I think any of the candidates here would have a better platform. Mine though goes further than most. Mine talks about not just having a head that is independent and has never worked in the DA's office, but staffed by attorneys as well who've never touched cases. That's very important. And we wanna be open. It should be misdemeanors. It should be cases that are bad science. It should be cases that involve um, unjust jury verdicts. We need to be open to the fact that we are infallible and, we, and things that we thought 10, 15 years ago might be different now. Marijuana is a great example of that. That's 
that's about to be legalized, those are cases that we should be leading expungement uh, efforts. Thank so you. that's where I would do it. Thank you. Now for a quick follow-up question for all candidates. There is a bill, Ooh, Mr. Qu Mr. Court, I forgot you. That's okay. <laughs> it's not, don't take it personally. I won't. <laughs> Um, the, uh, we need a, we need statewide legislation creating a conviction integrity agency because we really can't rely on district attorney's offices to review themselves. And that goes true whether I'm the district attorney or not. Uh, the only way to ensure a real second look is to create that separate statewide agency that does the review and then provides defense counsel and has discovery. But be that as it may, that's likely not to happen before January of 2022. Um, the, the biggest thing that I would do, and a lot of the other, uh, my colleagues have spoken about it, but we really have to go deeper and create an independent conviction integrity agency that looks broadly, not just at cases that have gone to trial, because as we know, 98% of cases end in plea agreements. There is no trial transcript. So we need to take a broad view on what we're second looking at the DA's office, but real reform will only come with a statewide agency that separates the second look from the district attorney's office that secured the conviction in the first place. Thank you, and my apologies. Uh, the next question is a follow-up for all of the candidates. Uh, there's a bill pending now that would ban police deception in interrogations, and it would introduce reliability into the admission, admissibility hearing assessing confession evidence. Will you support it? Ms. Orleans. Uh, I absolutely would support it. Uh, I don't think it goes far enough. I mean, I've seen the repercussions. I've had clients who I've tried false confession cases where clients of mine were tricked into saying things, had their family members' lives threatened, and the police faced no repercussions or accountability. And those practices are not only allowed, but routine. They must end, but that bill doesn't go far enough. It should be practice, and it will be my practice as Manhattan District Attorney, to have defense counsel present for any questioning of a person who's accused of a crime. That is the only way we can ensure someone's rights are not violated. And Thank I know you. that from my decade as a public defender. Thanks. Ms. Crotty. Um, sorry, I was. Uh, I haven't read that, so I, I'd like to read it before I comment, um, as I would on before I comment on everything. I, I mean, it sounds. I would like to know what how they're defining deception, and what are they? Uh, what are the definitions of reliability? These are subjective standards, so I want to make sure um, what the bill is actually saying before I say yes or no. But it sounds good, Mr. Court. Yes, I would. I would support legislation um, on reliability and getting rid of deception, or at least uh, certainly excluding uh, any confession that was secured based upon those methods. So I, I certainly would. Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. Yes, you know, uh, it's interesting in that report that I mentioned that we did with the Innocence Project, the most common uh, type of misconduct, a reason for exoneration that we found actually was false confessions. And to your earlier question about what kind of intake are you going to have in the conviction review unit that I supervised in Brooklyn, uh, we investigated and in one of these false confession cases um, that I ran, uh, that wasn't even one of the things that the incarcerated person had asked us to look at. And we found uh, a shocking false confession. So um, I do support legislation for getting this right and for having a program inside the DA's office that is also searching for truth and for correcting these wrongs. Thank you. Ms. Lang? We need look no further than the unconscionable thing that happened to the exonerated five to know how heinous the outcomes of using false confessions can be. I'm committed to looking at any legislation that seeks to address that and look forward to assessing the legislation that you describe and to adopting it to ensure that we can trust uh, uh, trust confessions that are made and rely upon them only where appropriate. Mr. Bragg. Yes, I support it. I was moved by the op-ed by the Exonerated Five on this bill uh, and by a presentation uh, where I was co-presenting on the issue of uh, police disciplinary records uh, by the Innocence Project. I've been the subject of 
interrogation deception. I know what it feels like. Uh, and I've also prosecuted an FBI agent who engaged in deception. So yes, I support it. Ms. Florence? I support any legislation that will make sure that people's rights are championed. So yes. Ms. Abushi. I'm the only candidate here that has time and time again gone up against the NYPD and held them accountable. Yes, I absolutely support this legislation, but we need to go further. And I propose not only a police accountability unit that is going to identify officers that engage in this misconduct and hold them accountable, but don't forget a lot of these wrongful convictions happen because of prosecutorial misconduct. Prosecutors who cover for bad policing because it helps them get an easy conviction. And so ADAs who engage in this behavior will also be held accountable. Thank you. This next question is for Ms. Fahardi and Weinstein, uh, Ms. Orleans, Ms. Crotty, and Ms. Abushi. Each of you will have one minute to respond. Every case should begin with an evaluation as to whether the issue at hand can be resolved outside the court or the legal system. However, prosecutors often make an indictment based solely on a police report that involves overcharging without concrete evidence which has lifelong effects on accused people and their families, including job loss, eviction, or losing custody of one's children. What will you do to ensure that police reports are not routinely elevated to indictment as a matter of course? Ms. Orleans, you have one minute. So I have time and time again seen circumstances where police officers and police reports are used as the only reason why someone is indicted, charged with a felony, removed from their home, had their lives destroyed, their families destroyed. You know, I've had clients experience, you know, complete upending, losing their homes, their jobs, their children on the basis of these conviction, I mean, um, indictments and sometimes convictions. But that's why we cannot rely solely on police officer testimony. This must be something that is a priority. And as someone who uh, also has gone up against the NYPD every day of my career, I have routinely held the police accountable. I've cross-examined police officers. I've examined their memo books. I've looked into the fact that some of them report, you know, make arrests 15 minutes before the end of their tour and therefore receive hours and hours of overtime. Our city is paying out hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money to police overtime because of the arrests they make at the end of their shifts. You know, this is something that's critically important that we call out. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why the five borough defenders who analyzed the policies of each and every one of the candidates in this race and found that mine out of anyone here would be the least harmful for black, brown, and low-income communities. And though they found several of my opponents who are career prosecutors fail to understand the harm of prosecution and systemic racism, while others have hearts that may in the right, be in the right places, but the lack of understanding of how criminal courts work Thank you. is needed to effectively implement progressive reforms. Thank you. Ms. Crowder, you have one minute. Well, um, in order to get an indictment in New York County, you need to go into the grand jury, uh, which means 23 people have to hear evidence and there is no hearsay admissible in uh, state grand juries. So that means that people have to actually go into the grand jury. You never get indicted on a police report. Uh, part of the job of the district attorney's office is to fully investigate cases. And the job of the district attorney, the way I understand it, the way it would be under my office is not to get convictions but to get it right. And that means if you, when you do the investigation and the proper investigation, you look at all the videotapes, you look at all the different things that add up to what is going on in this case. And if you don't have proof beyond a reasonable doubt, you should not be bringing that case into the grand jury and you should not be, be prosecuting that case. But if you do, then you should also think of, you know, if you can prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, you should think thoughtfully about what should happen in that case. Should it be community service? Should it be a program? Should it be an alternative to our incarceration? Or should it be jail? Ms. Fahadi and Weinstein. Look, uh, of course, we can't just routinely elevate or ever just elevate a police report into an indictment. The police are our partners in public safety, but we are not their instruments. And we have an independent ethical obligation to evaluate all the evidence that comes to us, whether it's testimony, something recounted in a report, video footage, documents, what have you, before we decide if we're going to take this case to the grand jury. And you know, I think 
one way to do that uh, that's important to me is to make sure that we have trained the assistant district attorneys who are in the early case assessment bureau, where these reports come in, right, on the front lines doing intake, to have the judgment and ability to know how to handle what comes in. You know, I think that um, it's it's troubling that often the youngest and the least experienced, the greenest prosecutors are the gatekeepers into the criminal justice system. And if you know, if we're serious about divesting from cases that don't advance public safety and to shrinking the system where we can, that it has to start there at the gate. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Abushi, one minute, please. It's imperative that the district attorney's office must be independent uh, from the NYPD. And um, even the current DA has gone so far as to deputize um, NYPD attorneys to not only um, issue DATs and summonses, but prosecute them. Um, and so I will thoroughly review um, any information coming out of the NYPD and officers, because unlike my colleagues who will follow the facts wherever they go, the facts are usually manipulated um, by officers. Um, and so in my proposal to replace the Early Case Assessment Bureau, I'm also going to replace uh, bureau chiefs um, and supervisors who are looking to make charges stick um, and instead work as much as possible to expand our decline to prosecute list and also release data and information to the public to assess how the reports are being made, what officers are making these reports, are there consistent patterns and behaviors that we need to identify, not just to throw out the case, but to make sure this officer doesn't continue to engage in the same behavior without accountability. Thank you. This next question is for Ms. Abushi, Mr. Court, Ms. Orleans, Ms. Florence, you will each have 30 seconds to respond. Parole reform is an essential component of any meaningful effort to reduce the number of people in the prison system. Historically, the Manhattan DA's office and the New York State DA's Association has opposed criminal justice reforms in New York. If you are elected, will you use the power of your office to push the swift passage of legislation like the Less Is More Act or the Elder Parole Bill? And do you have other ideas about how the district attorney's office can support reentry? Ms. Abushi, 30 seconds. I've actually signed on to those bills and I, I um, full heartedly support them. And it's time we use the DA's office as a bully pulpit to align and support advocates and reformers um, to change legislation, implement legislation and ensure that we are centering the community. Um, and the way to support reentry programs is to first decline to prosecute as many cases as, pro as possible. Right now we tear families down and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars doing it and then play savior on the other end, trying to build them back up with different programs. And so if we stop breaking people down and prosecuting um, crimes you. of social inequities, we don't have to um, worry about reentry. But in the event we Thank do, you. we Thank have you. programs. Ms. Orleans, 30 seconds. So I absolutely support less is more, elder parole. And furthermore, I am a fervently anti-death penalty advocate. I'm someone who has always been against the death penalty, and that includes death by incarceration. Right now, we have elderly people sitting in our jails and prisons waiting to die because of the infection rates of COVID. And that is unconscionable. We must do better. We must support these bills. We must get clemencies. We must use the bully pulpit of the DA's office. And that is exactly what I will do to advocate for these reforms and also just not seeking life sentences, not seeking sentences Thank over you. 20 years under any circumstance. Thank you. Ms. Florence, 30 seconds. I absolutely support both less is more and elder parole. When we talk about reentry, though, we need to be thinking about it not when six months someone prison, not even a year. We need to be thinking about it at the very beginning of a case when someone is charged. I've, I've discussed this type of program and worked together with, with organizations like GOSO, where they, they start when people are charged. And what we want to do is connect people to the services and job workforce development programs. I'm so 79 support. They have an amazing Thank program called so Pathways to Apprenticeship. That's the way I would approach reentry starting Thank at the beginning. Mr. Court, 30 seconds. Yes. Um, the less is more bill is critical, but it doesn't go far enough. So many of the services provided under parole are useless, a, a fleecing of the taxpayer, a waste of money, provide 
no social uh, benefit really. So I, I would push in Albany as I already have for greater reforms on the parole system. Elder parole is a critical step. Um, but the real question is which amongst us, the eight of us, is best able to lobby and work with the legislature to effectuate change. And, and I think it's, objectively, anyone would have to answer, I'm in the best position to do it. I've done it. And I've done it for 10 years in Albany. Thank you. This next question is for Mr. Bragg and Ms. Fahadi and Weinstein. You will each have 30 seconds to respond. You have made it known that if elected district attorney, you will use your resources to continue collecting records and conducting surveillance of youth through the Manhattan DA's office. You also stated that you will continue to collaborate with youth programming led by the NYPD and use the information provided against youth in court. Please comment on how you will continue your surveillance programs in our communities. Mr. Bragg. So I, I think that's inaccurate. If, 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 if someone may have misread the question here, I'm not going to be using uh, evidence uh, developed by the NYPD against you if it's, if it's, if it's one of part of one of their databases, like the gang database. I think the gang database is garbage in, garbage out. I won't be using it. Uh, I will continue my community work. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a Harlem Little League coach. I'm going to evaluate folks who come to my office as whole people, and I want them to be actively engaged uh, in the work of the community. So I will continue that and will promote that work. Ms. Fahadi and Weinstein, Weinstein, you have uh, 30 seconds. Thank you. I think that there are two uh, questions here, as, as Mr. Bragg pointed out. You know, when it comes to the way we collect information, I commit to being vigilant to make sure that these systems are not abused in the ways that they have been. I commit to having policies to make sure that we're using them responsibly. And I commit to working with advocates to make sure we use them responsibly and in a way that supports communities. And we shouldn't confuse places where we put information and leads and with and whatever that we are gathering with actual evidence of crimes. You know, we have to interrogate um, and we really have to do the work before we make that transition. Uh, you know, when it comes to the second part about communities, I think all of us do have to stay engaged in communities, including police officers, including law enforcement, uh, which is why I did not think uh, that we would want law enforcement and police officers to withdraw from being present and supportive of their communities and the communities in which they work. Thank you. The next question is going to Ms. Lang, Mr. Bragg, Ms. Abushi, and Ms. Crotty. Many reforms relating to criminal justice re relate only to nonviolent uh, crimes. Yet we all know that ending mass incarceration will actually require a different approach to so-called violent crime. As you also know, there are offenses that are designated violent, even though they actually don't involve harm, physical harm of any kind. Burglary is a prime example. There are people serving extremely long sentences, prison sentences because of burglary convictions, and or they have been designated violent predicates because of nonviolent, no physical harm, burglary convictions. Will you adopt any policies to prevent people from receiving extremely long sentences based on convictions that are technically violent, but not actually violent offenses? And what would those reforms be? Ms. Lang, you have one minute. We all know that ending mass incarceration as we must requires doing things drastically differently with respect to violent crime. That means stopping the prosecution of nonviolent offenses as violent including, for example, burglary in the third degree. It also, though, includes instances where there is some measure of violence reducing the length of sentences. So that means stopping the reliance on mandatory minimums, stopping the reliance on the three strikes law, and it means assessing cases and, and, uh, and not bringing the egregiously long sentences that we have seen in the past that have contributed to mass incarceration. Doing that requires that we build out a robust, responsive sentencing uh, set of protocols that includes availing ourselves of the rich community-based resources we have here in New York City to pair people appropriately with alternative responses and also develop a robust set of restorative justice practices to help make everyone whole. Mr. Bragg, one minute. Uh, yeah, it first starts with charging. Uh, my brother-in-law was overcharged uh, with a, a garbage constructive possession uh, gun count 
uh, which shouldn't have been brought. And if it were, it should have been brought at a much lower level. That kind of charging decision is the beginning of the problem. Uh, so we're going to be evaluating cases from the beginning. And the second, in terms of sentencing, I'm going to have the default position that the, the lowest end uh, of the sentencing range is going to be the default in my office. And if an assistant district attorney wants to go above that, they're going to have to seek supervisory approval in writing. Uh, and then once the charge is brought and we're at the sentencing phase, we're also going to offer uh, to all survivors uh, of a restorative justice option. It's going to be a policy in the office. And then finally, uh, I support sentencing lookbacks. Uh, and we'll obviously need legislation in Albany, but I support that. Uh, and we'll, we'll support it uh, as uh, using the bully pulpit as district attorney. Thank you. Ms. Bushi, one minute. Uh, a lot of the uh, designations for violent versus nonviolent serve as an opportunity to really up charges that should be misdemeanors and should be declined to prosecute. So I would focus on how we are, are charging felonies and, and avoid charging felonies, um, especially uh, making sure we don't continue to just proceed directly to indictment, indictments, which can trigger mandatory minimums and sentencing legislation kicks in where it essentially ties our hand. So it really starts at um, the intake of arrest reports. The second thing is I propose a sentencing review unit where we will take the initiative to review all cases that have excessive sentencing beyond 10 years and people who are immunocompromised or at the end of their sentence to ensure that we can have uh, early release wherever possible. Ms. Crotty? Yeah, I support, you know, especially when it comes to burglary, I think that we should not be charging burglary on a commercial burglary where there's apartments upstairs. Um, I think that's something that's done. And I think that that's something that should not be done. When I talked to the five borough defendants, I did, I do subscribe to uh, putting misdemeanors on putting a misdemeanor on every indictment, which then um, gives the district attorney's office leeway to do what they need to do in the case given on the facts and circumstances of that case and that defendant and where that defendant is. So I think there's ways that you really have to look at and all the DAs have to be ch charged, uh, trained, and really look at what is, and I don't think that they do this now and they haven't for what, quite some time, but look at the charges and look at the facts and look at the charges and then look at the, the defendant's rap sheet. And then once you look at all these facts and play the tape, what is going to, what is this person going to be facing if you charge this? And what is the person going to be charging if you face that? And really play the tape. I've never been a fan of 105 county indictment, indictments and I never will be, thanks. Reducing mass incarceration will require reconsideration of the approach to interpersonal violence, including shootings. In cases that involve charges that are legally defined as violent, you have all, with the exception of Ms. Crotty, committed to discontinue the current internal policies that prevent assistant district attorneys from consenting to alternatives to incarceration based on charges, and instead allow for consideration of community mediation, restorative justice, or diversion programming as options. We are interested in getting specific about these issues. For Ms. Florence, Ms. Crotty, and Ms. Lang, in your time as Manhattan District Attorney, in, the, in your time at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, how did the office get issues of violence wrong? And how would you respond to these issues differently? Ms. Florence, one minute. You know, the problem was and continues to be these blanket policies which disqualify people without knowing anything about them. That has never been my approach. I have always looked independently at the survivor of, of the crime and the person that is accused of the crime. And we need to fashion our dispositions based on those facts. A good example of that is years ago, I did an, uh, a case involving an insurance fraud, a major ring. There was an Uber driver who was accused. He, I had very solid evidence, could have used that case to ultimately convict him and send him to prison. But instead I looked individually at his circumstance and came up with a resolution that kept him out of prison and kept him without a felony record. That's the way we want to approach violent crime as well. There are times we need to consult with the survivors that we cannot do this in a vacuum. It needs a community-based approach. Ms. Lang, one minute. I witnessed a restorative justice process last year between a man whose father was murdered and the man who committed the crime. In all of my years of prosecuting violent crime, I have never seen a survivor, a victim of violent crime come out of the criminal justice system feeling more relief 
than the son of that murder victim did. Restorative just justice has tremendous promise and has to be scaled. The ways in which the district attorney's office has gotten wrong this approach in the past it has, has taken different forms over different times. One, it, it used to be just far too ad hoc that uh, whether or not someone was paired with services was based on kind of guesswork by the assistant DA and it wasn't clinically reformed, uh, informed. Then once the alternative to incarceration unit was built, it happened not at scale. So even though things were done, were somewhat clinically informed, it was a very small number of cases. We need to scale the responses to all kinds of crime to include restorative justice and, and pro-social supportive responses rather than punitive. Thank you, Ms. Crotty, one minute. Uh, I haven't been in the Manhattan DA's office since 2006. Uh, I left in 2006 and they do not have a lot of the programs that they have now. Um, it, when I was there, the, the alternative to incarceration was probation, uh, which I gave quite regularly when the facts dictated it. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to mediation and alternative to incarceration, I have had clients who've gone through th these programs and I've also been a trained mediator and I've, I have taken the 40 hour course on mediation and how it works with the New York Peace Institute. I think it's a great tool. And I think that these, that mediation and restorative justice are really the way to go in cases where the victim and the defendant are known to each other. Um, and there is not an addition of extreme violence that where they can work it out between themselves and not with the district attorney's office. And I, I applaud restorative justice uh, when the facts are appropriate for it. Thank you. For Ms. Bragg and Ms. Mr. Bragg and Ms. Farhadian Weinstein, you both worked as prosecutors in other jurisdictions, the Southern District of New York and the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, respectively. What, crit what critiques do you have for the approaches these offices took to issues of violence? How will you operationalize your approach to issues of violence? And how will you ensure that the policies and practices in your office are working? Ms. Farhadian Weinstein, one minute. You know, uh, Ms. Swarns, your previous question exemplified uh, a way in which the Brooklyn DA's office got it wrong. Um, I, I dealt with a case uh, of a man convicted in the early 90s for three robberies that he committed in the course of a week. He stole $100 worth of stuff. He was addicted to crack cocaine and he was homeless when he did this. And he got 32 and a half to 65 years because, because these were classified as violent crimes because in two of them he had a knife and in one of them he threw a punch. And, you know, we did what we could. I built the first post-conviction justice bureau in the country and we supported him for clemency and for parole. And he ultimately did get parole out of 25 years after 25 years, but of course that's too little too late. So we start with a reckoning of a case like that and we have to go back and we have to say, are we charging properly, right? I mean, this is why we have discretion so that we bring charges that fit the crime. The charges there didn't fit the crime. The, the stacking of the sentences in his case, the, the just lack of foresight to give him the services that he needed Thank you. Uh, in order to live safely in the community. Uh, and so we learn from the mistakes. Thank you, Mr. Bragg, one minute. Thank you. So I, when I was in the Southern District of New York, I was in the public corruption unit. So I, primarily my work was focused on, uh, you know, prosecuting the FBI agent I mentioned earlier, prosecuting corrupt politicians. Uh, but I would say the, 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 the violent crime work that was done, and I did do some of it, uh, you know, centering the trauma of survivors is something that should always be first and foremost uh, that we try to do, but could, could be improved upon uh, in, in, in all the offices I worked in. After I left the Southern District, I went and I became the chief deputy in the New York State Attorney General's office uh, and, you know, did things like you know, sue Harvey Weinstein and his company for having a hostile work environment and really focus there on the trauma of, of the survivors uh, and, and did other work bringing that to the fore for me, uh, including uh, suing and investigating two upstate school districts and shifting them to restorative justice uh, policies, really so we can really address uh, these issues in a more holistic way. Thank you. Thank you. For Mr. Quart, Ms. Orleans and Ms. Abushi. The candidate, you are the candidates who have made the clearest commitments to reducing incarceration and prosecution in general. So the question for you is, what will your approach to serious interpersonal violence be and how will you operationalize it? How will you know your 
your approach is working. Mr. Quart, you start off with one minute. Sorry. Um, we'll evaluate the cases based upon the numbers and we'll make sure that we're reaching our goals of actual decarceration. Um, and that's in the bail context. I, I think that this is critical. And I think one of the questions uh, that we asked is, would you commit to an 80% reduction in pretrial uh, incarceration? And I would. And I was the author of legislation in Albany that ended cash bail. So I'll be looking at specific processes in the office that ensure an actual outcome. And that outcome for me is decarceration. A question earlier, I think two questions ago, was about violent crime versus nonviolent crime. That dichotomy is a false one, as you know. If we're really going to achieve a higher level of decarceration, we have to look at some of these crimes uh, which are indicative of violence or had some element of violence. So sentencing reform, no cash bail, um, and even looking at our partners in Albany uh, to try uh, eliminate mandatory minimums as well as sentencing uh, reform. Uh, these are some of the things, a combination of legislative yep. and conduct within the courtroom. Ms. Orleans, you have one minute. Thank you. And while I think I was criticized earlier for having experts on my campaign, um, you know, I, I am very grateful to have a, a criminologist who analyzes all of the data, all of the arrest data in New York um, over the last decade or so. And, and looking at that, and it supplements my knowledge of my institutional knowledge of being a public defender and working for over a decade in the trenches in the courtroom. And so I know that the majority of cases that are brought are misdemeanors. These are, you know, property crimes, misdemeanors. These are, are not things that we need to be worrying about or focusing resources on. Now, yes, there are real crimes that occur in New York, but also when we talk about those, those are not being handled in such a way that actually is helping anyone. And these reforms across the board that I'm proposing in terms of thinking about diverting cases regardless of their classification of violent, um, you know, these are things that really are what actually keep communities safe. And, and these interventions the data shows uh, reduce violent crime overall and maintain my decarceral approach, which Thank is the you. primary value that I'm going into this with. Ms. Abushi, one minute. This is not a one woman show. Um, the new administration uh, in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has to include our community partners, those impacted by the system, civil rights attorneys, public defenders, public health professionals, community leaders that are going to hold us accountable and help us see this vision through. Um, I will partner with organizations like the Court Watch to ensure that our ADAs are compliant during these appearances. I will also ensure there's a direct line of communication between the defense bar and my office to rectify any interference with the pursuit of tricking the footprint of this office, declining to prosecute charges, or trying to upcharge cases um, that should be dismissed. Um, there is, there can't be accountability. We can't shrink the footprint of this office unless we let the public in. That is the only way this is going to work. Thank you. This next question is for Ms. Lang, Ms. Florence, and Ms. Crotty. All candidates pledge support to support immigrant communities who often face additional consequences from prosecution, including deportation. Can you give an example of how you will consider potential immigration consequences when deciding to bring charges against someone and having worked in the Manhattan DA's office, how that differs from current practices? Uh, we begin with you, Ms. Crowder, you have 30 seconds. You know, I, I think that immigrants are the lifeblood of our country and to, to, to really hold them um, in a special place for where we all come from. We are all immigrants. I worked with the Credible Fear Institute and I went into the Elizabeth Detention Center once a month to get immigrants ready for their Credible Fear interview so they could pass their asylum um, interview. I think that you, and I have a case today where I'm still fighting with the DA's office about immigrant status for my client and trying to get a better deal because if she does plead to certain charges, there are collateral consequences, which would virtually end her her way of life here in New York City. So I think this is a very important thing and that all DAs sh should consider this. Ms. Lang, you have 30 seconds. Immigration consequences uh, are only one of thousands of collateral consequences that attach to a criminal conviction. 
Under my administration, assistant district attorneys will assess the full realm of collateral consequences at the charging stage and then at every stage thereafter to ensure that no collateral consequences unduly impact the people who are charged based on those charges. We also have to think about immigration effects on victims. And that's why I have been an advocate for keeping ICE out of courthouses two years prior to the law mercifully changing and an expansion of U-bases to ensure that people who are crime victims are able to remain here. Ms. Florence, you have 30 seconds. I'm not just an advocate for immigrants. I've actually done the work to make sure that their their causes were championed and just. I a guy got a six million dollar verdict uh, against f- for five hundred workers, immigrant workers, and I also prosecuted companies and individuals who who killed immigrant workers. And I did that by building trust in that community, by going out and working with the organizations, and also making sure and instituting a policy in the construction fraud task force that in any case involving immigrants that we would make sure that no one could ask about their status. We need to make sure that when we charge things and we think about immigration from the moment it it, it is part of a case, we never want to write it down and we want to make sure that we are always thinking about the consequences because everyone deserves justice no matter where you're born. As a follow-up, additional consequences flow from almost every arrest. People might get evicted, lose their job, be forced to push a loved one out of their house or risk arrest. Again, having worked in the Manhattan DA's office, how would your policies differ from current practices? Ms. Lang, you have 30 seconds. As described in my previous answer, I will catalog the full realm of consequences and ensure that every assistant district attorney is well aware of what they are and is mindful of them in each individual instance, and that where those consequences will unduly impact someone, that that is factored into the decision at every stage of the game. There is no reason that someone should be kicked out of their housing, deprived of their children, or any number of other outrageous consequences simply by dint of criminal justice contact, and that will be top of mind under my administration. Ms. Florence, you have 30 seconds. Once again, it's about what you've actually done to champion immigrants' rights. And I've done that through the cases, and I've done that by going out and actively getting the sources of information to bring the cases. That is different. I was an outsider at that office, and I'm the one who championed this type of approach. And it's something that I won't make just about the construction fraud task force. It needs to be approached in every single case. And of course, we need to think about what people are pleading to, because it has consequences far beyond whether uh, the, the case itself, whether in 15 years from now they can get a job or work on a, a public uh, a public site. So we need to be thinking about all of these things, and these are the things that I will make sure are policy throughout the office. Thank you. Ms. Crowder, you have 30 seconds. Um, I am a defense attorney, and I am very well versed in the collateral, the collateral consequences that defendants face in ev- each and every case. I have been arguing that to the Manhattan DA's office for the past 13 years. Um, I don't need to be told what the collateral consequences are. I know what they are, and they are vast. They are, and they're not even the, the ones that you mentioned aren't even the laundry list. So that has to go into each and every case. I know that I've been doing that for the past 13 years. And I make sure when I leave this office that the district attorney's office will be able to consider those things and make the right decision based on all of those factors. Thank you. This question is for Ms. Abushi, Ms. Orleans, Mr. Court, and Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. Each of you has committed to making office policies and procedures available to the public in addition to data regarding charging, plea offers, sentencing recommendations, bail requests, dispositions, and case outcomes disaggregated by race, gender, ethnicity, and geography. What are the specifics of your data transparency plan? Why is transparency an important issue for you? And why do you think that no other New York City district attorney currently provides this information to the public? Ms. Abushi, 30 seconds. In our early case assessment bureau that we will soon replace with our arrest review unit, that is where we will begin to track um, all the information that comes in relating to a case by officer, by charge, by information, alternative evidence, the prosecutor on the case, the history of that officer, the history of the prosecutor, we're gonna get knee deep into things. And you can't have public trust without transparency. And I don't trust prosecutors to watch prosecutors, just like we don't want uh, trust officers to hold other officers accountable. Uh, Day 
data and transparency and the collection and the analysis is important if we're really going to be serious and meaningfully transform this office um, and protect black and brown communities from being the face of crime. Thank and um, That is, we have to share the information. Ms. Orleans, 30 seconds. So the reason why I'm so passionate about the transparency of data is because of my career as a public defender. When I had a client who was a single mother who the Manhattan District Attorney's Office wouldn't come off what's called a 90 day split, which means 90 days jail plus five years of probation to just give her straight probation, even if she was willing to take a plea to the charge. And I'm sitting there emailing the rest of my colleagues saying, has anyone ever gotten this disposition on this case? The Manhattan District Attorney's Office is telling me they don't do that. And so why is it that as a public defender, I'm having to beg colleagues to cobble together cases to figure out whether or not certain offers are being made? It is absolutely unjust. It does not do anything except for perpetuate the racist nature of the system. And that is why we will be fully transparent with all of our data. Mr. Court, 30 seconds. Uh, transparency is critical for two reasons. One, the FOIL laws under the state of New York uh, are not are barely workable. District attorney's office, especially Vance, barely ever complies. And secondly, the city council, uh, uh, despite its efforts, is not the best uh, in terms of oversight of district attorney's office. They really deal with funding. So the governmental response on oversight is limited. That's why transparency is so critical. And if you look at my nine point plan on reforming the sex crimes unit within the office, several of those points deal with transparency and disclosure. And it's because the government, government model of disclosure is not working that the district attorney himself has to disclose. Thank you, Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. I am fully committed to transparency. And the reason why is because I think this is the way we get to racial justice and to justice. You know, Judge Garland, my mentor, uh, in his remarks a couple weeks ago, accepting his nomination, he said, our core mission is to treat like cases alike. So we need the data to tell us if two people are charged with the same crime, are they getting different plea agreements? Are two victims of the same crime being dealt with differently? And, you know, you ask, why haven't DA's offices done this before? I think that there is a culture of secrecy that has something to do with protecting our discretion. And I also think that we are, uh, shall we say, modernizing uh, and bringing these bureaucracies into the 21st century Thank you. part of that. Okay, so now, if, if people wanna stretch, this is probably best time to do it for a quick stretch. We would now do a lightning round of yes or no answers and then move into questions from the community members and people who have been prosecuted by the Matt and district attorney. Uh, to say again, this lightning round is simply yes or no. Uh, so in a good, every candidate will be given an opportunity to say yes or no. I'll call your name. You can say yes or no. Uh, yes or no. Defund the police. Mr. Karate. No. Ms. Karate. Ms. Karate. Sorry. No. Ms. Florence. Can't answer that yes or no. I don't believe in that word. Ms. Lang. Yes. Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. No. Mr. Bragg. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, yes is the $1 billion in cuts that the folks, activists in New York were seeking. Mr. Court. Yes. Ms. Orleans. Yes, by 50%. Ms. Abushi. Yes, without limitation. Each of you, with the exception of Ms. Crotty, have pledged to produce a list of charges that you would decline to prosecute in the interest of justice by January of 2021. Where can we find your list? And if you don't have one, when can we expect to see those? Ms. Lang. In collaboration with community partners by the time I take office. Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. I'm working on it and I've offered the framework for breaking out cases that we never prosecute, that we prosecute differently and that we only prosecute with supervisory approval. Mr. Brad. Uh, by Friday, Monday at the latest. Ms. Orleans. I was gonna say by January means I have four more days. I, I'll have it up. Ms. Abushi. We have our policy up and it's a live document that we're proud to partner with our community organizations, public defenders and civil rights attorneys to continue to expand it. Mr. Court. My list uh, has been made public months ago. Ms. Crotty. I'm not gonna have a list. 
Ms. Florence. My, my platform on this and my list is on my website. It's been there since September. This is another yes or no answer. Ban NYPD game database. Ms. Orleans. 100%. Absolutely. Mr. Bragg. Yes. Ms. Florence. Yes. Ms. Abushi. Absolutely. Ms. Karate. Only with convictions. Ms. Lang. Yes. Mr. Court. Yes. Ms. Verhadian Weinstein. You say ban, excuse me. Yes. Um, yes, ban. ban. No. Thank you. Another lightning round, yes or no. Commitment to end the trial tax. Mr. Court. Yes. Mr. Bragg. Yes. Ms. Florence. Yes. Ms. Abushi. Yes. Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. Yes. Ms. Lang. Yes. Ms. Orleans. Yes, and the hearing tax. Uh, Ms. Crotty. Yes. This one here is a yes or no also. Eliminate NYPD's vice squad. Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. Uh, it, it depends what you mean. I think it should be replaced by a different uh, a different part of the PD to do some of those cases. Ms. Karate. Well, vice has to undercover uh, prostitution rings. Is that what you're referring to? That's one element of it, yes. Well, to that element, yes. To the other elements, I don't understand what the question would refer to. Ms. Florence. Yes. Ms. Lang. Yes. Ms. Abushi. Absolutely. I've called for the elimination of the vice unit and for the decriminalization of sex work. Mr. Court. Yes. Mr. Bragg. Yes. Ms. Orleans. Yes. And I have the most detailed decriminalization of sex work policy on my website. And I called for the disbanding of vice. The next round of questions come from community members who have been, who have direct contact with the Manhattan DA's office. The first question comes from Anna of the Freedom Agenda and is for Ms. Lang, Mr. Court, and Mr. Bragg. I have lived in Manhattan for 37 years. My son was detained pre-trial on Rikers Island for six years before accepting a plea deal and serving four years upstate. We have heard from most of you that you would direct your ADAs not to request bail, jail, or remand at arraignment. Will there be any exception to this policy? Will you replace these orders with other conditions, such as supervision or electronic monitoring? Ms. Fang, 30 seconds. Thank you for that question, and I'm so sorry to hear about your ideal. I'm committed to the end of cash bail, and that requires a build out, not of supervised release, but of supportive release of an infrastructure that will ensure that people have the services they need to remain at home at liberty while they await their day in court. Mr. Court, 30 seconds. And uh, thank you for the question. And uh, uh, since the last time we met in Albany, um, I'm so sorry for what you're going through. As you know, yes, I authored legislation um, and uh, ending to ending cash bail and fought against the rollbacks of the bail reform in Albany itself. But we cannot end cash bail and replace that when expanding remand. Um, that's not progress. That's the antithesis of progress. Uh, and so we won't do that. We're going to reconnect people to their communities so they can make rational decisions in their neighborhoods with their families about their future. Thank you. Mr. Bragg, 30 seconds. Uh, so sorry for that experience. I, I'm the only candidate, I believe, who's ever posted bail. I posted bail and, I, and I've had a relative live with me uh, while uh, out on bail. I would in cash bail and I would provide supportive services like I did for my loved one. Uh, that's the way we need to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes via video from Sejoyna. Sorry, from I didn't get to answer that one. Same here. It fits for everyone. Not. Not for everyone. Yeah, it was for Ms. Lang, Ms. Court, and Ms. Mr. Bright. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, this next question comes via video from Sejoyner from Survived and Punished. 
and will be answered by Ms. Fahadian Weinstein, Ms. Orleans, and Ms. Florence. Hello, I'm Sojourner, a Black survivor of sexual violence. I'm also a member of Survived and Punished New York and part of an abolitionist defense team pushing back against Manhattan District Attorney's prosecution of survivors. My question is, Tracy McCarter is a black woman, nurse, mother, grandmother, and a survivor who is currently being prosecuted by Cy Vance for defending herself from her abusive husband. If you are elected as Manhattan District Attorney, will you commit to dropping all the charges against her? Will you also commit to not prosecuting all survivors of gender-based domestic and sexual violence, including those criminalized for their acts of survival? Ms. Fahady Weinstein, uh, you have 30 seconds. Uh, you will go first. Thank you for the important question. Look, I can't make a commitment about an open case in the Manhattan DA's office based on what I'm hearing about the case on the outside, right? You know, I have to um, approach everything with an open mind. I'm familiar with that case. I will tell you that I do stand with survivors, survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence, uh, and I absolutely commit to making sure that they are not being criminalized for what they've experienced. And in fact, I led the program in the Brooklyn DA's office where we put the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act into motion uh, and made sure that we were going back to sentences of people in the circumstances you described uh, and made sure that their own experience with abuse was being accounted for. Thank you. Ms. Orleans, you have 30 seconds. Yes, so I'm probably the only person here who's actually represented someone and tried to utilize the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act in order to get a reduced sentencing. So I think prosecutors here all want to say they stand with survivors, they care about survivors, but what they don't recognize is that those are the same people who they end up prosecuting and seeking years and years of prison on. I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on Tracy's case, especially because when I'm the next Manhattan District Attorney, that will be my decision, but I'm so sorry for what she's going through. And I truly believe that the DVSJA needs to be utilized in a way that doesn't just continue to violate the human rights and human dignity of people who've already experienced so much pain and so much trauma. And so I, I think that we need to really be careful about putting someone in charge of reforming this system who either has no experience in the trenches fighting or who spent their career propping it up. Thank you. Should Ms. I go? Forms, 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. No, unfortunately, it's just not appropriate for any of us to be commenting on open cases because we all hope to seek to take that office. However, I am the only one here who has vast experience, not standing with survivors, but fighting alongside them. I have done these cases. I understand very clearly that it is extremely complicated. And the best way of approaching cases involving domestic violence and sexual assault is not always the traditional approach. That means when I was doing these cases, we were aren't always going with prosecuting for the actual assault. Sometimes we found alternate crimes that didn't require the women and kids who were involved to testify. Sometimes it Thank meant you. we didn't prosecute at all. The point is we need to be looking at survivors, understanding that nobody is perfect and we can't expect people to have perfect, perfect backgrounds and work with them in order to get justice. Thank you. Our next question comes from Eileen Mayer of Vocal New York. The, this question is for Ms. Crotty, Ms. Abushi, and Mr. Court. My name is Eileen Marr. I'm a community leader at Vocal New York, and I've been prosecuted in Manhattan. I was threatened with an extremely long illegal sentence by the ADA and the judge if I had gone to trial. So I took a plea. It was the only thing I could do. What will you as district attorney do to eliminate the epidemic of wrongful convictions as well as eliminate the traditional bullying practices where ADAs coerce plea agreements by threatening very, very long sentences? Mr. Court, 30 seconds. Yes, um, thank you for the question and uh, I'm sorry for what happened to you. Uh, you start with sentencing reform. 
Um, it's a critical component, something I've long been for in this campaign uh, about never asking for more than 20 years. But to your specific question, it's about the coercive practices of individual district, district attorneys. I mean, I answered in a question earlier about different recruitment and different retention to try and bring in new lawyers in the case. And I'll have a higher degree of regulation of bureau chiefs over that sort of conduct. And there'll be real ramifications. Um, attorneys like that who conduct themselves like that will no longer work in the office. Thank you. Ms. Crotty, 30 seconds. The job of the district attorney, as I understand it, as being both a have former prosecutor and a current district attorney, I mean, as a current public, I, I'm getting all confused. I'm so sorry. I am a defense attorney. But I think the job is to get it right. The, the job is to get it right, not to convict. And if you get it right and you investigate on each and every case, you will get fair results. And if the mandate from the leadership office is to get it right and not to convict, it doesn't matter a, a long plea sentence because if you don't have it right, you shouldn't be doing that. So I think you really have to look at the facts of each and every case. I have already said tonight that I would um, put a misdemeanor on every indictment so that we would have a mechanism for fairness. And Thank that's you. what I would. Ms. Abushi, 30 seconds. Eileen, your situation is familiar to me and I'm sorry for that. The deal on the table for my father was seven years before he took it to trial. When he refused, they charged my mother and asked for 46 years. And that's how he was sentenced to 22 years in prison. We simply need to create office-wide policy that people will not be penalized for invoking their constitutional rights. And again, I will have checks and balances, i.e. the public, PDs, civil rights attorneys, organizations that are going to watch ADAs who engage in this behavior report directly to me and, and meet on a consistent basis to identify ADAs who are engaging in this problematic behavior. And again, hold them accountable as well. Thank you. Our next video question comes from a parent and advocate from Harlem, Taylon Murphy, and will be directed to Ms. Bragg, Ms. Fahadian Weinstein, Ms. Florence, and Ms. Lane. I would ask that if I say thank you, that probably means your time is up. So I don't want to be rude and like cut you off, but we're, we're over a little bit right now. So we're going to run that video. My name is Taylon Murphy. I'm a community leader, activist, and credible messenger. My question tonight is if you are in favor of using conspiracy charges, however limited to charging so-called street gangs, can you please provide us with your definition of what is a street gang, as well as why the public should trust you to make these distinctions? Thank you. Again, I ask that you only go 30 seconds. And if I say thank you, that means your time is up. Mr. Bragg, you have 30 seconds. I've been falsely accused of being in a gang. I know this issue well. Uh, I would not use a conspiracy law on, you know, basically to get convict people by mere association. Loose knit groups of kids uh, are not something I would use the conspiracy law on. I would use it as I have throughout my career to prosecute corrupt politicians, to prosecute owners of businesses who've laundered uh, millions of dollars of drug money that have really harmed our communities. I would not use it on loose groups of children in our neighborhoods, our kids, my kids, my Sunday school students. Thank you, Ms. Verhadian. Weinstein, 30 seconds, please. Taylon, thank you. Look, uh, I would use gang charges only when appropriate. Uh, a gang is not just a group of kids who are hanging out together, obviously. Uh, I know what street gangs are because I've prosecuted street gangs, which are groups of people who are actively committing crimes together. And in some instances, you know, offshoots of the Bloods, for example, I prosecuted, or members of MS-13, Gang charges can be appropriate. Thank you. Ms. Florence, 30 seconds, please. I've prosecuted major gun traffickers. I've prosecuted major companies that have engaged in organized fraud, and I've, I've prosecuted executives. I understand very well how to use these types of, of statutes. And what I know is you can't do them as a blunt instrument. We need to be precise and surgical. 
every person needs to have evidence beyond a reason that we can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. So when we do a, a violent gang, we need to be thinking about the communities in which they are existing. And if they are terrorizing residents of low income communities or any community at all, then they need to be held accountable. But we're not going to do it based on innuendo or Facebook post. We need to do it on evidence. That's the way I've always done my cases. And I'm proud of my record. Miss Lang, 30 Thank seconds, please. Thank you for your question, Mr. Murphy. Thank you for your service. And I'm so sorry for your loss. I will commit to the end of the use of conspiracy charges for prosecuting so-called street gangs and indeed commit to the end of the use of street gangs as it has been understood to target uh, groups of, of young people, especially young men of color. I will use conspiracy statutes to prosecute kingpins who bring poison and weapons into our communities. And you can trust me to be the person who does that because I have done that work and because I have worked to reform the system from both inside and outside. And I will continue to work on that reform as your next district attorney. Thank you. Our final video comes from Melissa Curo, a member of the Catal Center for Equity, Health and Justice. It is directed to Ms. Crotty, Ms. Orleans, and Ms. Abushi. Again, 30 seconds only. Correction. We do not have on the video from uh, Ms. Kiro for this evening. So I think we are at the end of our time. And so why don't we go on to the next segment? I'll pass it to you, Sally. So because we went over a lot, uh, we were gonna have Q and A, but we don't have time for that. Uh, I want to thank all of the candidates for participating this evening and uh, apologies if I, if I screwed up any names at any given time. <laughs> uh, and uh, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. Uh, if there aren't any other questions or concerns from the panelists or my wonderful co-moderator, I think this is, this is it. Okay, so again, thank you all for participating. It was an honor and a pleasure to participate for me in this in this forum. And hopefully, you know, the audience that we have that were listening got a great opportunity to get some insight into who you are as candidates and uh, looking forward to, to you all continuing your campaign as we move closer and closer throughout the next year to, uh, to the election. Thank you. Thank you.